Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's uh, 6.15 and we want to make sure we're um, respectful of your time. So thank you all for coming tonight and uh, here for our last and final meeting for the Dogwood Elementary Study Capacity Relief Study. Um, a little review of the agenda tonight. We have uh, our scheduled time is from 6 to 7.30 tonight. Uh, we'd like to review some of the public information session uh, survey results, which you have uh, the, the packets and materials in front of you uh, that you should have picked up when you signed in. Uh, we're going to have let you guys talk in small groups about some of that and just uh, also talk about the options and just the project as a whole as you start to formulate uh, thoughts towards a recommendation. Then you're going to be working through a voting process to, to uh, vote to recommend a plan for uh, to give Dogwood some um, some capacity relief and then we're gonna let you guys uh, go ho go home for the for the evening so here is where we are in the in the calendar you can see the final we're at the final meeting um, after this after this presentation and after this meeting and uh, we will start engaging the and bringing your recommendation forward to the school board the Board of Education is uh, that presentation is planned for May 7th and then uh, the board will host a public hearing after that as part of their process and um, on May 15th. And then they're expected to make a decision on June the 11th on a, a, a boundary uh, change plan for this, for this process. Just to recap on the objectives for this process, is a, this uh, is a community-based comprehensive boundary study that's tasked with meeting the following key objectives is to provide capacity relief to Dogwood Elementary School, um, to cre create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize capacity, and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. There are considerations and rules that we follow, and this is a recap. We've talked about these several times and uh, oriented the public and us, the committee, on these. But these are basically uh, Rule 1280, and these are the established by the board, and they are um, the, basically the rules to follow when you look at the viability of moving an area one way or the other. You always bring that, the, yourself back into the focus of these rules and considerations and ask yourself, uh, does making this change, or uh, if you're looking at a couple of different options side by side, you ask yourself which plan best adheres to these rules as a whole. And these are to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system, the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned, efficient use of capacity in affected schools, long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future capital plans, the location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns, phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools, and that, that doesn't apply in this particular study because our focus is only on elementary schools. No other, air, no other levels, middle or high school, are, are anticipated to be impacted as part of this study. And additional considerations are use of geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways. So as you examine uh, the, the four options that we have, that we have in front of you um, that you have helped to build through this process, always look at them through that lens and look at uh, and start thinking about which option best adheres to these criteria as a whole as you start to frame your recommendation um, as a result of tonight's meeting. There's some, a few follow-up uh, follow question from meeting three, and there was a lot of discussion around Cunningham Drive, and uh, we have a circle of it uh, in here. This is the northern part of the Dogwood uh, attendance boundary, sort of stretches up north, and there's some apartments in that region that uh, feed into Dogwood. And there is, there is a bit of discussion about there's a single-family development here that, uh, that has a road that actually comes into, uh, that sort of tees into this area, but the road is closed, and you can see there's a picture of it here, a road closed sign and uh, some posts that, that have a chain that block the road. Um, 
So we, there has been some question about that, because that, is that something that's a permanent or temporary, and what, what's, the nature, what's the status of that? Um, so this is a, these barriers do prevent access onto Fairbrook Road, and the transportation office has talked to the county to try to figure out what's going on with that and what's, and what's the nature of that road closure. Um, they, they said that the homeowners association um, or the residents in this area, in order to remove that barrier, they would require a vote of residents uh, with 75% of the, the residents to support withdrawing that, that barrier. So they have to have a, they'd have to, you, they'd have to go house to house and have a vote for, for the residents in this area to see if they want to remove that barrier. And 75% of those residents who respond would have to say yes to remove it, and then, then, the, then the county would go in and remove, um, remove, that, uh, remove that barrier. So that, that's the answer for, for this area. It's, um, it, it would take a, a, I think that my takeaway with this is that it would take a pretty substantial effort to get that barrier removed. And, um, and so that's, that's sort of an answer, some fin finality on uh, what's the status of this road closure that, that exists in, in our study area. Talking about the public information session, we had a public information session on February 27th to gather feedback from the community on options for, um, for the revised attendance boundaries. There was an online survey that accompanied that public information session uh, that, that spanned from February 27th to March 13th, 2019. Um, we had 16 total respondents participate in this survey. And that's not strikingly surprising to me because the areas that we're impacting are very small. There's, uh, we're, if you look at what we're doing and the amount of people that are impacted and children that are impacted as part of this study, it's a, it's a, a small subset of the population. And so um, in, in, in other studies where you're moving thousands of students, you would expect a lot more uh, uh, a feedback from members of the public, but since this area has such a small impact area, um, I'm not too surprised that we have, uh, that we've had only 16 respondents uh, participate in the survey. Um, one of the things is that you have the survey results is in your packet of information, so you have that information in there to study and see what the respondents said. Uh, there were some comments in there and some, and some in, there was input uh, based on what, what they, their feelings and their, their thoughts and observations regarding the options. Um, but I would, guide, I would uh, encourage you, and we tell the committees all the time this, is that to remember this as, use this as just one additional piece of data to help frame your recommendation. Don't use this as the sole basis for determining which option to recommend. Um, parents always provide input based on uh, what's their focus, their main focus is, it's perfectly natural, but they provide input based on how their family is being impacted, how their household is being impacted, or community. And um, think about uh, what, what this, the, the big picture of this is that you have to focus on a plan that best meets the needs of all students in the area and um, in all communities. And so don't, don't make this, uh, don't, don't use this as the sole basis for your decision but uh, focus on those objectives and considerations in the Rule 1280 as you, as you finalize um, your decision. So the public was asked about their overall opinion towards an option, and options one and four received the, the most strongly in favor votes. Um, option one also received the most responses from those who were strongly opposed to, the, um, to, the, to a particular option. Options two and three received the most somewhat in favor votes, um, which was uh, kind of in between strongly in favor and neutral. So they were somewhat in favor um, of, of options two and three. But options one and four received the most uh, votes for those who were strongly in favor of, uh, of a particular option. The primary reason for supporting uh, the options were that, um, that they address current overcrowding and they maintain neighborhood continuity. And, and, and as you look at the, the, the different options, you see there's different, different adjustments that are made. Most of the adjustments are, exist up in that northern sort of peninsula area 
of dogwood, and we were looking at different configurations of the, um, the apartment complex. Uh, the, it's a very large community up there, and it's currently split between dogwood and, and feather bed, but um, this, what you're looking at, the options that you were considering, move different sections of, of that and make, take a larger share to, uh, to feather bed, and, um, and so that's something to, um, something to look at. And, you know, I think that you guys were looking at different, different alternatives and which ways would be more suitable, and again, as it relates to those considerations in Rule 1280. The primary concern of those opposed to an option were that it does not address the current overcrowding and that uh, some people may have thought that the option didn't do enough to give, the, to give Dogwood some relief. And uh, so there are some options that give them some measures of relief and others that, that different measures and uh, magnitudes of relief at Dogwood. And also does not address long-term enrollment needs. And so um, we've, this, is a, this is a challenge for you as a committee because you have to be, uh, be careful to help provide relief to Dogwood as much as you can, but don't do it in a manner that it's gonna overload and, and actually negatively impact Featherbed Lane. And so that's, you know, that's something that, that it's a tough decision to make is how much relief can we provide dogwood without compromising and, and, and creating a, a negative situation at Featherbed Lane as a result of this, this process. I'm gonna go over the advantages and limitations of the, of the four options. And uh, this is something that after this, we're gonna let you brainstorm and do some pros and cons and look at the different options. So to kind of frame your own thoughts and you can certainly use these, and you have this material in your packet of information as well. So option one um, uses Rolling Road as a, bound, as a boundary to provide more relief to dogwood. So this has this region right here. The, the current boundaries are the uh, green outlines. And you can see east of Rolling Road, and this option goes to Featherbed Lane. Um, and, that's, and that's currently that, that area goes to dogwood. It crosses over both sides of Rolling Road. Um, that's seen as an advantage because it does use major geographic features like a major road as a dividing line for that particular option. Some of the limitations with this option is, um, is that it provides the least relief of all options to Dogwood Elementary. Um, the, the areas that have been impacted in this one are uh, we've, the east of Rolling Road and then the northernmost part of this, uh, this area in Dogwood was moved to Featherbed. But in this option, we also added students uh, there was a trade. We took students out of Dogwood and then added some students from Featherbed into Dogwood in this particular option, which does impact uh, the most students. So this, that, that creates an, a, a larger impact than, than possibly um, necessary as, as it relates to some of the other, the other particular options. Um, and then apart, there's more splits of the apartments. And this, this, apartment, in the, uh, this apartment complex in the north um, it looks like it could be connected, and this is this helps. This is that Cunningham Road area that we were talking about. The thought was that originally that some of this community could come through Cunningham and, and get access to communities that are already going to Featherbed. But in reality, with that Cunningham Road closure, this this community would have to uh, come back through the apartments here and uh, and out of them, and so they'd have to go through a large area of dogwood in order to get get access and, and get transported to Featherbed Lane. Um, and then any shift results in a split from elementary to middle. It's a limitation. I think it's a limitation that exists in any of the four options that we're looking at. Just because this dividing line that exists right now from, uh, for Featherbed and Dogwood is the current dividing line for the middle schools in this area. So I don't think there's anything we can do to avoid that, uh, uh, to avoid any split at all. Option two, again, uses Rolling Road. This area of Rolling Road is, is pulled into Featherbed Lane in this particular option, which is, uh, follows along major roads. Um, this option also impacts the fewest number of students, so it pulls a Rolling Road and then a small corner, bottom right corner, of this area that goes to Dogwood in these apartments. And, um, and that's, that, those are the two areas that are pulled into Featherbed from Dogwood. You'll notice that there is no adjustment in this option. No, no, no students are being transferred into Dogwood in this. It's only students coming from Dogwood to Featherbed Lane. Um, 
some of the limitations in this is that the, the apartments are further split. So in, a, in, a, in an ideal situation, in a perfect world, it'd be nice to keep all of the apartments in this region intact and not have to split um, uh, certain apartments off of the, of, the, of the majority of the community to go to different schools. Um, they, do, they are currently divided, and some of it are, currently does go to Featherbed, and we're just making that split a little bit larger. But uh, it's, it's something that we identify as a limitation because it's not the most ideal situation, but, uh, but it may be something that's necessary as part of, uh, of your work. And then again, another limitation is any shift results in a split from elementary to middle, like I had mentioned. <clears throat> option three, um, again, option three does the rolling road adjustment uh, here, east of rolling road. Um, and then pulls the northern part of some of the apartments off of, uh, out of Dogwood and into Featherbed Lane. And you'll have large plot maps, and for members of the public, we also have large plot maps in the back that you can see the detailed road names if you guys wanted to see the more specifics of which areas are, are being impacted in these options. Um, this option has the second best balance of utilization among the four draft options. Um, it impacts the second fewest number of students. Limitations on this is that, again, just like I had identified in others, that apartments are split, uh, further split in, as a result of this. And, um, this, and, and uh, another one is that the middle school, uh, there's an additional middle school split, like I had mentioned, that exists in all four, four options. Option four is a little bit different of a look that the committee had developed as a result of the last... Uh, their last meeting in meeting three, I believe. Um, this was one where you keep rolling road, both sides of rolling road in dogwood. And I think that part of that rationale was to, for proximity, that this, that this community is, is very close to dogwood. It's, it's really right, at, you cross over rolling road and dogwood's right there. And so that was one of the, some of your thoughts with, with keeping that in dogwood. And instead, you took the, um, just the eastern side of the apartments and, and just shifted a little bit more of that to Featherbed Lane. And when you look at this, the way, the way that this community comes out, they come out of, uh, of Rolling Road, which is right here, and the, the access out of these apartments is primarily out of Rolling Road, and access onto Rolling Road. And there are already apartments that are being, um, like I said, that are going to Featherbed, so you just took it a little bit further in and, um, and had that feed into Featherbed Lane, which was a, um, a good concept that you had, uh, had drafted. Some of the pros and advantages of this is that it does provide the best balance of utilization among all four options, so it gives Dogwood the, 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 the best relief as it relates to, um, to the utilization. Um, they, um, the apartments in the northern part of the Dogwood area are less split between two zones, so this seems more natural, uh, more natural of a split. The other option that you were looking at pulled the one area that was sort of deep inside of the community, and the other one was looking at sort of a northern section of the, of the, of the uh, apartments being split off. This one kind of just sort of tapers it a little bit further west, and so you have a, a large block of co the community going to Featherbed and the remainder going to Dogwood. Um, another advantage is that this does provide the most relief to dogwood, like I had mentioned. And um, one of the limitations is that, that students still have to cross uh, rolling road to get to dogwood, but there are also advantages to, to that and the proximity component, like I had said, for those to remain at, at uh, dogwood elementary, which is where they currently go. So do you guys have any questions about the four options or any of the stuff, any of the material that I have presented so far? Um, any thoughts or, con or uh, any conversation around that? Yes, ma'am. Do you have a slide with the utilization percents? The utilization percents. I'm looking through my notebook, and I'm, it's just not readily available. Great. Yes, Thank you. I just want to have that available when we get to work. That's yes, ma'am. Thank you. Those large plot table plots are there for you to, to for your for your small group work. Yes, ma'am. That's all. Um, we um, we we're, we're limiting the discussion to committee members, but when we when we when they break into small groups, I will certainly come talk with you guys and 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 talk about uh, the questions that you have as well. Um, 
but part of our process is to make sure that the committee does the work of the committee and the, and the, the observers uh, 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 don't participate in these particular meetings. Yes, ma'am. I just had um, one question. I know that these figures and the um, projections are based on the September 30th enrollment, which at Featherbed is typically lower than any other month in the school year. So I know your statement that you made earlier about providing relief for dogwood um, spilling over to overcrowded at Featherbed. So do you all look at any trend data beyond just this year's 30-day um, enrollment to see what our average enrollment was? Because it definitely exceeds, um, well, we had 639 listed here for your 30-day enrollment. And we rolled like 661, 662, 660 for the remainder of the year. So if you're talking to add 70 more kids on top of that, then you're at over 700, which then exceeds at least what I saw on the chart as it relates to the capacity for the school. Yes, the enrollment fluctuates. Uh, the nature of enrollment is it's the kids are constantly enrolling, withdrawing in the system. And so enrollment always sort of goes up and down throughout the course of the school year. It is best practice to use that September 30th date as a, a point in time, and that's the basis for the school district's uh, enrollment projection data. Um, we have provided some projection information to the committee, which is in the background report and inside your materials that has the projected enrollment for the school, so you could see what the, what the district is looking at in terms of the, uh, a, a 10 year or five year projection. Um, so that you can use that as an additional resource to help understand um, how the, the trends are looking for, for the, the two different schools. I think that um, that probably exists uh, not only in Featherbed Lane, but that, that phenomenon probably exists in Dogwood as well as, as enrollment fluctuates up and down and, um, and things like that. And so um, it's not always an isolated incident to one school. It's a com thing that we see commonly across, um, across all, all school divisions and school districts. So why don't we, why don't we take our next step and have you guys work in a group? And I think that with, uh, with what we have, uh, the, the size of our group, I think we'll just consolidate into one group and you guys can work together. And um, what we'd like you to do is just uh, review all four options. Um, it's important to note that these options have not been modified since you last met. And so options one through four are still in the same state that they were when we presented at the public information session. Um, this will give you time to review the survey information, take a, take a, a sort of a, a larger look at all four uh, options together side by side. And what we'd like you to do is you have a sheet of paper that, that lists the uh, option group review. So you basically can identify the strengths and weaknesses with each option. You've done some of this in the past through different exercises, but it just kind of helps you further discover and uh, just to give you, uh, help inform you on the strengths and weaknesses of, of each option. And I, I can always pull up prior slides of those advantages and limitations if you guys want me to. Um, the principals will act as facilitators and recorders of this, so the principals are not uh, voting, voting members of this committee, and so the, 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 they, they will not be voting on a recommendation as part of the policy, but, um, but they will help guide your discussion and help facilitate your discussion as you work in this. So we'll give you some time. We have 30 minutes blocked out for this, but if you need more time, then we'll certainly give it to you. Um, do you have any questions about the small, small group work? Okay, well, I'll let you go, go to it, and then, uh, and then we'll, we can have a discussion once you guys have some time to, to review the options. One thing before you get together, there is, a, as you deliberate on the options, review the objectives and considerations. So ask yourself, how do they support the boundary study objectives and considerations? So look at the tables and the maps. Not only look at the, the, the way the maps are configured, but also look at the tables and, uh, and help, that'll help kind of guide your discussion as you look through this. 
So I'm going to let you guys get to, get to work in your small group discussion, and we'll regroup here shortly.
Okay, I think we're ready to regroup uh, and have a discussion. Um, let's, uh, let's, before we get into the nominations and voting, let's, uh, let's just hear some of your thoughts and some of the, the, the conversations that you guys were having as you were evaluating the options and, and working towards uh, coming up with a, a recommendation. Does anybody want to share any thoughts of uh, a recap on your conversations? Okay, um, when we was going over the options, we really um, were looking at option number two and number three. Um, number two seems to be the less impacted with the students moving over to Featherbed. And we saw that the flow in um, option two of uh, where the buses already go um, to pick up the Featherbed kids in the townhomes, we felt that it wouldn't be too much for them to just to pick up another couple streets. Mm -hmm. And we um, kept it as the, what's the rolling road side would um, move over to Featherbed. Um, and in option three, it was pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers may have been a little bit, but we don't want to overcrowd Featherbed mm -hmm. just because of, you know, dog was overcrowded. So we tried to kind of have like a middle ground with both of them. And um, I think that's about it. Anybody else want to add to it? Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I think that's that certainly is a good, good thought. And uh, you're considering all the different factors here. And, um, and so I think it's, you know, it's, it's good to deliberate all over these and determine what you, what you feel and uh, the best plan that's best for both schools as, as well as all the children in this, in this region. Um, so now we're going to go into some, uh, some voting pr pr procedures so that we can finalize the, the recommendation. A uh, couple of uh, rules and things for the voting is that principals are not allowed to vote. I think that you, uh, the, the voting members have been given the little act to vote uh, clicker. Um, the, the expectation is the committee is going to vote on one scenario uh, to, to, as a result of this process. So one recommendation, one, one plan is, is expected to uh, move forward to the, to the school board. The Board of Education has access to the website, study data, survey data, and the results in all scenarios. So they are going to be looking at all of this information and uh, the, the whole body of work that you have done leading up to this, to this, uh, to this vote. Um, when you do vote, just consider those study goals in Rule, 12, Rule 1280, which I think you have certainly have, and uh, given it a lot of thought and good, good uh, deliberation on. So we have these active vote devices that you have in front of you. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to conduct this vote in two rounds. And, uh, and, and so what we'd like to do is have the first vote be used to reduce the options to two. So you've had discussion on which ones that you feel, like you've already discussed kind of which ones you want to narrow down, the two that you kind of brought and before you made your, your, your decision on the recommendation. So, um, so once we do narrow to two, then we can have open the floor again for a discussion if we want to discuss anything, anything else with that. And then once that is done, then you will make a final vote to vote on which of the two you want to recommend for the, to the Board of Education. Um, you have any questions on that? So the first one is going to be uh, the vote to, uh, to narrow down to, um, to two options. And is this the... Um, is this the two vote one? Yes, this is all three or four options. Okay, all four options are here. So which so so you will help. So basically, when you look through this, you will you will pick uh, A, B, C, or D to and pick two options that you would like to uh, to have. No, no, no. no there's two and one. They, they vote for one. And if okay. There's, if there's a split vote, then that's what. Okay. Doing. My apologies. So just vote for one one option, and then the results of this will help determine if, if we do have two or if we need to do a third vote. So if we are unanimous and there's consensus among, among it, then, 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 we will own, then this could be the final vote. So can we Yeah, we can start it over if you want. Okay, yes, let's clear it out and restart it. 
Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead. Now you can vote on which option you feel best meets the objectives and uh, criteria, the policy uh, 1280, and then we'll see how this, how this lands. So all three have, have voted. Okay, and so all three have voted for option two, which, uh, so that means there's no need for a secondary vote. So um, option two is the, is the option that we will bring forward to the recommendation. Um, and um, if we could go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so what I would like you to do as, as committee members is, uh, and we will do the same, is that committee members who weren't able to be here tonight, Encourage them to, to um, you know, share the word with them on what the recommendation is, and we will as well. And you can also encourage them to, if they feel like they'd like to, to give some insight or support your recommendation, tell, encourage them to come to the public hearing, which is going to be housed here. And, um, and they can come here and also uh, tell the Board of Education that, uh, uh, their thoughts about your recommendation. So I know that a couple of committee members were not able to make it tonight. Uh, due to other unforeseen circumstances, but encourage them to come to that public hearing and, uh, and, and, and show their support for your recommendation or whatever, however they feel about, about what has been uh, recommended. So our ne that, that uh, recommendation is going forth to the board on Tuesday, May 7th, and then that hearing I was talking about is Wednesday, May 15th, and that's going to be here at this, in, in, this, uh, in this school at the Woodlawn High School Auditorium. It's going to be in the auditorium, correct, and not at the, in the cafeteria. So it'll be in the auditorium at this building, at that public, at that public hearing. And then the board will vote on June the 11th. And um, you guys don't have to come to these meetings. This isn't mandatory. You're, the, the hard work you've done is, is, is coming to a complete uh, completion tonight. And we really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy schedules and coming here for these meetings and, and participating in this process. Uh, committee members and staff and everybody, it's been very helpful and we really appreciate your, your participation in this process. Um, you guys have any other final closing thoughts or anything before we let you go home? Thanks again, you guys, and you guys have a great night and we'll, uh, we will talk with you soon.